Dave Middlebrook here with The Law and You, and I'm super excited about today's episode because we're gonna get outside of the lane a little bit, and we're gonna just, not just focus on legal issues, but we're gonna talk about operations, about finance, about HR issues, all the things that have to come together for an organization to be super successful. I think you're gonna be really motivated by today's episode. So join me for The Law and You. This is Dave Middlebrook with The Law and You. So excited about today's episode. You know, our goal is to bring legal issues, things that impact you and your life into your living room. And today I have an opportunity to introduce you to someone that I'm really excited to get to know better, Susie Jennings. And Susie, I am, I cannot tell you why and in the depth of my excitement. One of the things you know, you and I have talked about, I work with churches and ministries and parachurch organizations all across the country and have done for three decades. And I get calls from folks and they'll tell me, you know, I really feel like the Lord's calling me to do this, but then they'll start to lay out all of the things they feel is gonna keep them from doing it. And I tell them, well, if he's got a calling on your life, he'll make a way. And today, you're going to be a great testimony to how the Lord has made a way. Welcome to The Law and You. Thank you so much, Dave. It's such a privilege and such an honor to speak about the Lord. Amen. Tell us, we're going to talk a lot about Operation Care International, but yes. I, I would ask you to just hit the rewind button a little bit and take us back to where you were a nurse at Baylor, yes. our nurse, were at Baylor, and you were not in ministry. And give us some of the, the facts that led to you to launching uh, your ministry. Well, um, I was hired by Baylor Hospital. I came here from the Philippines and um, I met my late husband at First Baptist Dallas and nine years we were married. And uh, I was a nurse then uh, mm -hmm. because I was hired. I became a supervisor at uh, Baylor uh, Hospital. And after that, um, a tragedy happened in my life. Okay. And what, what, how did that, how did that tragedy work into what God's using you for at this time? Well, um, I, I married my husband whom I met at First Baptist for nine years we're married, but he developed a serotonin deficiency, okay. a chemical imbalance. He was in the army before and he disappeared one day, March 9, 1993. He disappeared from our home. And for one month he was missing. Mm. And on that month, the whole month, I would read Psalms chapter by chapter. And that gave me some uh, joy knowing that the verse said, Psalms 30 verse five, weeping me endure for a night. Joy comes in the morning. And so for 30 days, my husband was missing. And then we found him later, 30 days later, when a farmer from Oklahoma found his car in mm. Oklahoma. And then they told us they found a car, but they did not find David. So we went to Oklahoma. So David was missing March 9, 1993. And then we found him April 8 of 1993, 30 mm. days later. And there uh, we found him on that day. We found David. David was hiding in a ravine. David committed suicide. Oh, he so shot sorry. his head from a chemical imbalance that caused severe depression. And he was buried. He was, we found him Thursday and Saturday he was buried a day before Easter. Mm. He was supposed to sing in our church. The title of his song was Heaven. Mm. And the pastor said, now he's singing his song with the Lord. Because David was saved when he was a little boy. And it was an illness that killed David, mm -hmm. his mm -hmm. chemical imbalance. And when a tragedy like that occurs in so many people's lives, that's the end, not the beginning. But in my reading about you and preparing for this interview, that was in many ways the beginning yes. of a calling that the Lord had on your life. Tell yes. us about that. Well, after we buried my husband, three months later, I had a car accident, so I became disabled, so I mm. could not walk. And then two, day, two months later, when I started walking, my next door neighbor shot his heart 30 feet from me, committed suicide just like my husband. That's when I got wow. really mad at God. Yes. I questioned God, why, why, why? Why did you allow that to happen? And the Lord answered me that night. He gave me a dream. 
September 7, 1993, my dream was I was knocking at my neighbor's doors telling them about Jesus. Okay. So something happened. The next day I woke up, I decided I'm going to choose joy because the Bible said yes. when I was reading Psalms for 30 days that David was missing, the Bible said, weeping may endure for a night. Joy comes in the morning. Psalms 30 verse 5. So the next day I woke up and then I just said, Lord, what can I do for you? <laughs> and what did he say? I tell you guys, do not ask God, what can you do for him? <laughs> if you are not prepared, it's going to yeah. take you out of your comfort zone. Man, That's exactly yes. what God did to me. In October 1993, he took me under the bridge in downtown Dallas, leaving First Baptist Dallas, going home. We were driving, me and my mom, my widowed mother, I was driving. And then I heard an incredible voice. And it said, look at your left side. I said, I look, I saw 100 men and women living in cardboard boxes mm -hmm. under the bridge. God said, you go under the bridge and help the homeless. My response, no, not me. <laughs> These are crazy. I could not stand homeless people. Because when I was growing up in the Philippines, my mother used to feed the homeless in mm. our kitchen. So they ate my food, occupied my space. So I did not like them. Then uh, one day when I was 10 years old, um, a schizophrenic homeless woman slapped me while I was in, in the marketplace. And so that really added to my dislike sure. of homeless people. Okay, and so what year was that when you, you 1993, saw? 1993. When my husband died, March 9. This was wow. uh, October 1993 when the Lord took me under the bridge. She gave you the vision. Yes, and he, sure. he spoke to me. Yeah. I heard the voice of God. That was my road to Damascus experience when I heard God really talking to me. Like I said, no, I'm not going to go there. No, not me. And the <laughs> Lord said, you ask me. What sure. can you do for me? So take us forward. And then what? I said, oh, forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Father. I would go. What could I take to these needy people? And the voice said, blankets. The next day, 24 hours after the event, after the um, talking, the Lord talking to me, I went to Baylor Hospital and I asked God um, uh, for direction. And so I asked people to give me five dollars so I could buy blankets. So I, then I became a blanket lady of Dallas because I would carry blankets in the trunk of my car every Saturday. Me and my mama, 80 year old mother, would push a cart in Walmart and we will fill up the cart with blankets. We'll take it home and we'll go to another city buy all their blankets. For eight years, I became the blanket lady, and then I will uh, pay blankets. I will ask people for money. And so eight years later, I got tired of doing it by myself and my mom. So I said, Lord, I can't take it. Uh, it's too much work. So this is 2001, right? Yes. Yeah, 2001. When I said, no, I'm not going to do it anymore. <laughs> Enough blankets. Then something amazing happened. Let's hear it. Next week, my uh, two weeks later, my best friend called me. She said, Susie, why don't you become a nonprofit? Uh, my husband will set you up. And that's what exactly what God told me two weeks prior. He said, you're going to become a nonprofit. See, when God gives a vision, he will give provision. That's right. And that was the start of a ministry. So from 2001, we distributed blanket, a thousand blanket every December. We called it Birthday Bash for Jesus, where we give away a thousand blankets in downtown Dallas and share the gospel one-on-one -on -one to the homeless. So I will have the blanket. I will tape a gospel track on top of the blanket. I'll give it to the homeless and give them a hug. And then God took away my sense of smell. I could not smell homeless smell, but I could smell nice smell, <laughs> but not homeless smell. So that's how amazing God turned me around from my dislike for the homeless people to my complete love for the homeless people. Mm, so you were the blanket that lady my, in Dallas. Yes. yes. That was, that's my name up to now, the blanket lady. Okay. So they still call me a blanket lady for some homeless that have been uh, there for a while now. But anyway, but we are now beyond blankets, so... So two, yeah, 2001, you were became a nonprofit. Yes, okay. and then we distributed blankets for three years every December. We call it birthday bash every third Saturday of December. We distributed blankets and give away to the people and share Jesus. Two things we do always. Mm -hmm. Share the gospel. Remember the knocking on my sure. doors? That was God telling me, you are going to evangelize. Okay. And the blanket is just an instrument. So that's what we did. And I'm going to pause and, and give a, a, a little pitch for folks that uh, it's important. I'm a nonprofit lawyer and I incorporate a lot of nonprofits, right? Uh, it's important at a certain stage and phase that the entity uh, be created. Yes. And it, it, I'm sure that had an impact on how people viewed you as opposed to your mom. Right. In the in, in in the trunk, you know, and you're yes. going around. So now you're a nonprofit. Yes, we're an official nonprofit. You can get cards with, and with letterhead. Cards, letterheads. We have to apply to it to IRS and to the state of Texas. 
So now we became a, a real nonprofit. So people could give money more yeah. and, and they could use it for their tax exempt. Yeah, so. so all of that's really important in yes. addition to the liability protection and all yes. of that that comes with being a nonprofit corporation. Right. Uh, so so you, you begin as a nonprofit entity and how did you grow from there? So you went from blankets to... Well, in 2004, God gave me a vision that we will hold, instead of birthday party just with blankets, that we will hold a big birthday party at the Dallas Convention Center and occupy 100,000 square feet where, number one, we share Jesus. Number two, we wash feet of the homeless. And then we provide them with, um, first thing, they, when, what they do when they come inside the convention center, we share Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. We take them to the foot washing. We wash their feet. That's the trademark of Operation Care. That's humility, okay. servanthood of Jesus. Okay. We want to emulate the character of Christ. And then we take them to haircuts, makeover, food, flu shots, eyeglasses, uh, coats, sleeping bags. Then we also have areas where they could call family members. And if they get reunited with their family, we have a psychologist on board that would counsel. And then we take them to the bus and pay $200 per homeless to go home once they get reconnected so they're not homeless anymore. And we follow up, make sure they have jobs and they have a place to stay. And the children's area have zip lines, pony rides, petting zoo, rock wall climbing, toys, backpacks, food, eyeglasses, and a massive uh, area where they could have a bounce houses, giant bounce houses. And of course, Jesus is always shared to the families. And that's the heart of the ministry is sharing the gospel. Now, for those that are watching, you may have put together the fact where there's a big Texas flag over my shoulder that we're in Texas. Uh, specifically today, we're in Grapevine, Texas, which is part of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. And she's referring to the Dallas Convention Center, which is one of the largest convention centers in America. Okay, so this is not small time stuff. This is a big deal. I'm sure there were a lot of hurdles you had to go over going from your trunk <laughs> with your mom and some blankets yes. to lots of Absolutely. hurdles. Absolutely. Yeah. And Absolutely. How, yeah. How, tell us about some of those. How did you get, I was looking at some of the photographs. I mean, we had the military, we had yes. uh, sponsorship from for-profits and non-profits yes. and churches and all that. I mean, that's, that's a big journey. Well, the biggest hurdle all the time is we don't have any money all the time. So, uh, uh, 30 days before the first event, when God gave me a vision of that first event, we and didn't that, have any And that money. year, tell us what year that 2004, it was. Okay, 2004, when we opened up Convention Center for a big birthday party for Jesus. 30 days before the event, we only have $20 given by an eight-year-old boy. He broke his piggyback when he heard that we're giving a party for the homeless. He broke his piggyback, gave it to his mama. Mama, give this to the homeless in Dallas so they could have a party. That was the two fish and five loaves. We didn't have any money, but Convention Center was prepared because we told them, we called in the summer, I called, they said, hey, we're going to have a party, Operation Care International. We'll have, it was called Operation Care Dallas at that time. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a party and we're going to be the large birthday party for Jesus with the homeless as our guest of honor mm -hmm. and the poor. And they said, okay. So they had the place secured for us. They forgot to ask for deposits. 60 days before they were supposed to ask it. God allowed them to forget. So 30 days, we still have not given deposits. We have $20 and the whole the city is aware there's a party. And we have to provide sleeping bags, blankets, shoes, socks, and uh, personal care items, coats. So there's a lot of money needed. Well, we have $20, but I believe in the call. I believe God told me there will be a birthday party for Jesus. So I asked, I, that morning I woke up, November 18, 2004. I woke up, I said, Lord Jesus, it's going to be your birthday 30 days from now. We don't have any money. We have $20 in the bank. Your name is at, is at stake. I told God his name is in trouble. Mm. And I went to work. That same day, I got a phone call from my best friend who was in charge of fundraising. She said, Susie, this morning I went to my friend. I asked for money so she could help us with our birthday party for Jesus because we don't have any money. We only have one month left because I have so much faith in God, I was called to do it. I just told the Lord, I said, Lord, your, your name is in trouble. So my friend Diane went to her friend. Her name is Dottie Thompson. She was the owner of 7-Eleven. <laughs> so Dottie said, how much do you need? And Diane said, well, we need $100,000 right now. So we could pay for our sleeping bags, blankets, we could order food, we could pay the rent, and then we could order buses to pick up homeless from Fort Worth to 
come to Dallas. We ordered like 10 buses, dark buses. And we didn't have any money. It was just pure faith. Mm. And the woman uh, said to Diane, how much would you need right now? Diane said, we need 100,000. And the lady said, Daddy Thompson said, that's really amazing because that's exactly the amount I want to mm-hmm. give. I went to the hospital two weeks ago. I wanted to really give money to charity, but I was not able to do it. Mm-hmm. So, okay. Exciting news. That's the amount I wanted to give to charity. So I'm going to write you $100,000. Mm. So that check was given that same night when I prayed, God, your name is at stake. Yeah. And you know, Susie, uh, being involved in working with ministries and churches over these many years, stories like that, and I want, I want, to, I want to share this with folks, that um, that's very common. I mean, it, God, God will make a way uh, but but these stories where people will say, and we were, well, I told you one. Uh, I had a client that God called him to buy a hospital in Los Angeles. And, uh, and we went about working on getting that price negotiated and all that kind of stuff. And we got down to the, he said, when we finally had reached terms, they said, well, I'm, we're going to go out there and get that money. I was like, you don't have the money? He's like, well, no, I mean, God's going to make yeah. a way and I'll be back in 90 days. And he did. And so uh, many people know about that. Yeah. That's the yeah. Dream Center in L.A. Yeah, I went there. Uh, yeah. So it's an amazing, amazing place. OK, so completely, completely cool what you're talking about here. So take us, take us, tell us a few more chapters in this story. Well, um, we have homeless people that, would, that came to our event. One homeless uh, woman was living in the car. And she came to our event, and when what happened inside the convention center just blows her mind away. I mean, entertainment here, people washing feet, kneeling down and washing the dirtiest, stinkiest, and smelliest feet in the world. And the people doing the washing, tell me who they, who are these, these people? are volunteers. We have 3,700 volunteers. Uh, and then uh, the first event, we have actually 1,500 in the first event. Now we have up to 3,700 Volunteers. These volunteers come from different churches. Right now, we have 3,700 coming from 300 churches and ministries all over Dallas-Fort Worth okay. area. And so um, this woman went there. Her feet was washed. Her hair, you know, they had trimmed her hair and all that. And she was blown away because she said, I have never experienced so much love. And then she found hope. While she was mm. there. And then out of that, she got out of homelessness. Now she had an apartment. She got a car. She got a job. Then she founded a baking. She, she now has a business owner. So she has her own business. Wow. Amazing. So as you've continued to do these events, you've had them annually in Dallas? Yes. Okay. 17 years now. And um, we started 2004. So it's 18th year this year. Okay. And uh, we reached... Uh, from 10,000 homeless and poor people up to 20,000 one day that attended our event. It's almost like you're doing missionary work. I mean, really. Yes, this is our mission. Urban missionary work, right? This is our mission field in Dallas, but we are not only in Dallas. We are now in 46 countries. Okay, well, we take me how we got there. I'm very curious because that's a big leap when you leave (laughs) Dallas-Fort Worth. Where did you go next? Well, in 2008, the Lord told me to start a ministry for the children in the Philippines, which becomes, that's when our name changed to International. Okay. From Operation Care Dallas to Operation Care International. Okay. So we started in the Philippines in 2008. We called it Christmas in July. So we copied what we do in December. We take it in July to outside uh, America, and then we help children, and then we evangelize, and then we partner with churches. Or ministries that's already in that country that help the homeless and the poor children. Mm. And we partner with them so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And then we provide the money so they could buy backpacks, t-shirts, shoes, socks, also food and school supplies and Bibles. Okay. And then we share the Lord Jesus and then we do foot washing. So that's what we do all over the world. So we started in the Philippines in 2008. And then uh, the next year we were in India. Then the following year we were in China and Taiwan. And then we were in Cambodia, then we were in Indonesia, then we were in Israel, then we were in Jordan, then we went to Nepal, then we went to the Amazon. Okay. Yeah, so we were in 11 countries. We impacted 28,000 children and thousands got saved together with their families. So that's the start of the international part. 
But you might ask why 46? I mentioned 46. So right now, in the middle of the pandemic, something incredible happened. And I want to hear it. Do you have time? I do have time. But, you know, before you tell me, because I, I, I think this is going to just blow my socks off, but, but share with folks, you, you shared that one challenge, that first event, no money. Yes. What's, what's some other challenges that you've had to overcome to get to 46 countries? Oh, of course. Um, we did not have uh, the team. We did not know what we were doing in the first event. We didn't have a clue what will happen in the first event. We did not expect 10,000 people will come in our first event. Right. So the challenge was, of course, always financial. And, of course, you need to make sure you have contracts. You need to sign legal contra- stuff. Legal stuff. They needed to be done first before you could get right. to the convention center. So we have to make sure all, those that, all of that is done. We need to have insurances. So all, these are yeah. some challenges. And we need to have the warehouse. And we need to have also uh, another different type of insurance. What's the, where's the warehouse? It's in Dallas, in okay. South Dallas, and what in you, Oak Cliff. Yeah, yeah. What do, what do you store at your warehouse? Uh, we store shoes and uh, canned goods and backpacks and T-shirts and sleeping bags and blankets and toys. And then we give away, now we give away a monthly distribution to 38 uh, shelters and ministries every month. We became like a fulfillment center. where And we give away stuff every month to different shelters. So we are not a one-day event, okay? mm but we are, we are known to hold the largest event, birthday party for Jesus in the world, in the world. Okay. Nobody could claim 10,000 to 20,000 people attending a birthday party, okay? Yeah. So there were countless challenges, big and small. Big and small. To get there. Many of them legal. Many of them operational. Yes. But never spiritual because you knew what God called you to do. Oh, I, I knew my purpose. Number one is to share Jesus. Yes. And then number two help their physical needs because what good would it do if you keep on sharing and the person is hungry sure. you need to feed the person yeah. feed the soul and the, and the soul and the body you know pastor tommy barnett who i was telling yes. you about earlier made such an indelible impression upon me and in what he said is see a hurt and heal it see a need and fill it he said that's what we're doing here in 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 la is we're just going to see hurt Mm-hmm. and heal it. We're going to see needs and we're going to fill it. And then the Lord will direct us in every other way. There's just have to stay mission focused. Mission yes, focused. it's always about... It sounds like that's exactly what you all have done. Just stay focused. All, yes, it's all about uh, what, you know, will this bring glory to God? Mm-hmm. Everything that we do, two questions that I ask myself. What would Jesus do in that situation? Number two, will this bring glory to God? Mm. So if I'm placed in any kind of situation, I will ask myself, what would Jesus do right now? And will this bring glory to God? So all the time, God solves it. Yes. Now, I interrupted you. You're going to tell me a, a story about why 46. Yes. Yeah. So tell, tell me what that was about. Well, during the pandemic, uh, we were able to reach to 46 countries because God gave me a, a greater vision, a world vision that happened, started in 2013 of January 1 to 7. Uh the Lord put in my heart to go to a prayer mountain, start fasting and praying every January 1 to 7. So in, I started, in Korea? I started in Indonesia, Indonesia first okay. because I, it was in Indonesia when the Lord spoke to my spirit. We were doing Operation Care Indonesia in 2012 in July. Then God said, you're coming back to Indonesia in this prayer mountain in Indonesia. I was in the prayer mountain in Indonesia. And some, some of the folks watching may not be familiar with that term or what that means. I'm familiar with it with Dr. Cho in Korea. Yes. So tell me what Prayer Mountain well, means. Prayer Mountain them. is a place where you could find refuge and just be quiet with God. So that's where at the Prayer Mountain I went to Indonesia and then I started fasting and praying and asking God's direction. So I would read the Bible. I would ask God, Lord, tell me, direct me to what you want me to do with Operation Care. And that's when he started giving me a, a much greater vision than just holding a birthday party for Jesus in Dallas, Texas. So now we occupied 500,000 square feet from 100 to 500,000 square feet. We moved, of warehouse space? No, of the of, convention center. Uh, of whoa, the party, good Lord. Party event, half a million square feet now. So it's a much bigger event. And so when I went to Indonesia, uh, the Lord spoke to my heart when I started fasting and praying. He said, your vision... Um, 
Number one is that this birthday party for Jesus will be capped in 50 states. Wow. So I was fasting and praying seven days straight. I was not eating. I was just, you know, liquid and then reading the word. And then the Lord would speak very, very loud and clear to me. That was the first vision he told me. Instruction. Your birthday party for Jesus will be in 50 states. 2014, I went back to Indonesia, Prayer Mountain, January 1 to 7. He told me, he said, your uh, birthday party for Jesus will be in uh, all over the world. Okay. The third year, I was in South Korea, Prayer Mountain. The Talk biggest, the largest yeah. prayer mountain, 5,000 people attended right. one prayer time. And the Lord spoke to my spirit. He said, this birthday party for Jesus will be culminated with an event on the evening to be an evangelistic celebration, like a crusade type, wherein you will invite the biggest, the largest evangelist, you know, Franklin Graham and all those other evangelists to come yes. and preach the word. And I could envision that this will happen not only in Dallas, but all over the world. The vision is that each church, each uh, Coliseum or stadium will be full of people on the third Saturday of December celebrating Jesus' birthday. In the morning, we will take care of the homeless and the poor. We'll give them Jesus and also give them goods. In the evening, we'll open up the gospel to all the people in that city. So if each church in that city or over the world will just have an event, millions, no, not millions, Billions will come to know Christ in one night. Mm. So our hashtag is hashtag one day millionaires, H-E-I-R-S, one day millionaires. Nope, I don't like millions. Erase it. One day billionaires, one day billionaires. Because mm. there will be heirs, billions will come to know Christ in mm. one day. Man. From the bushes of Africa to the islands of the Philippines to the uh, and church in China to the rivers of Russia mm. and to all over the world. Jesus will be preached. Uh, imagine if um, the Lord would have revealed that to you that first day. I, I imagine you wouldn't have been able to even comprehend it no, or it, imagine it, right? It took seven years for all the vision to come. Sure. Uh, because the, the next year, the fourth year, he said, you will focus on the children uh, ages 7 to 12 because that's the age where they needed shoes to go to school. And then the following year, he told me, he said, you're going the two uh, focus is evangelism and foot washing. And then the following year, the sixth year, he said, you're going to adopt countries and you will give them $10,000 per country so they could buy shoes, so they could have foot washing and evangelism. And then the seventh year, he said, you're going to adopt America, each state, you will give $10,000 per state. And that's when I had a problem. <laughs> Why is that? Why do we have to give 10000 to New York and Chicago and <laughs> California? Yeah, I mean, they have so much money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the Lord gave me an answer. Okay, tell me. He said, I wanted Dallas Fort Worth to be the lighthouse of the world. Mm. I wanted Dallas Fort Worth to be the epicenter of kindness and generosity. The word epicenter was given to me January 2019 when the pandemic was not there yet. Mm. It was given to me. The Lord spoke to me at the prayer mountain. Wow. And he told me that it will be an epicenter. So the seven year that I was fasting and praying, the Lord revealed to me the vision. It was completed on the seventh year. Why seven is perfect number? Yeah, of course. I I, I got to tell you, it's it's it uh, it recharges my batteries to be around you and people like you. I, I just love it, and I love seeing uh, how the Lord, as you said. You said if he, if you, I can't remember the words you use exactly. If he has a, if you have a calling on your life, if there, he's going to make a way. He's going to make if a vision. He's going to provide provision. provision. When God gives a vision, he gives provision. Yeah, of course. And so, I, what a testimony that uh, statement is in your life and in the ministry's life. And we're going to come back in another episode, and we're going to talk about some of the stuff that. I, I call the three-legged stool of ministry. First is the calling. That's one, one leg. Second is you got to have good people. And the third is you got to have good operations and legal and accounting and all Amen. the other things, right? You got, you got to have those Absolutely. things in alignment to, to, to make it strong. So we're going to talk about that in our next episode. Okay? Yes. All right. This is Dave Middlebrook with The Law on You. And I'm, again, so happy you were able to join us today. We're going to Continue our discussion with Susie Jennings and Operation Care International and uh, look forward to uh, uh, having you join us.